Right. So right now we are going to start off um, by the introduction. I'm going to give you an overview of uh, the concept of integration and to explain really how does an integrated management system work because that is key to understanding uh, and also conducting an audit. You have to know how does the management system works. And in this case, we have to establish the intended outcome of the integrated management system. So this is what I'm going to do at the first uh, the first section. I'm going to explain in more detail, uh, give you examples of really how an integrated management system is applied and how is it expected to work in an organization. So right there, I'm going to give you an example for uh, Dewa. This is one of the utilities companies we have here in Dubai. And, um, you know, they use an integrated management system. And I just thought this is going to be very, uh, it's going to be a very good and relevant example to really help you understand how the how uh, integrated management system are supposed to work. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm also going to do, I'm also going to uh, share with you uh, the, you know, I'm going to be having reference on the integrated management system from ISO, especially from this use of integrated management system. You know, in integrated management systems, it's very, very important for an auditor to understand the proper way to integrate management systems. So this handbook right here, it also comes alongside your toolkit and force bundle. It's going to explain how can you use an integrated management system and also uh, the role of the Annex S. So this is basically the framework we use for integrated management systems. So this is going to be the, um, the first part of the webinar. I'm going to explain explaining more what exactly is the integrated management system. Because when you're conducting an audit for an integrated management system, you really have to understand how does it work. That is going to help you to gather relevant audit evidence in order for you to understand what exactly is called the evidence of conformity, consistency, and continual improvement. These are the three key performance parameters, or these are, this is where we are going to gather our audit evidence by asking questions, doing document review, and observing in order to gather evidence of conformance, consistency, and continual improvement to the framework of the integrated management system. When it comes to the training, as you can see, this is a, it's a CPD approved training program. So I'm going to be using uh, a lot of uh, case studies and examples because the idea of a CPD training is basically to equip you with the skills and necessary resources for you to do this on your own and also to document your activities, okay? That is CPD. So these are audit work papers that you are going to be using today. And I'm also going to show you how to create an audit checklist, how to write an audit report, and also how to close out an audit uh, report like that. Uh, after the introduction, when we have clarified and explained really how to use an integrated management system, I'm going to go into the seven steps of conducting an audit. And as you can see at each step now, I'm going to show you what to do and I'll give you a couple of examples. So this is expected to be a straightforward and uh, relatively easy to understand uh, webinar. And I'm sure that by the end of this webinar, all of you would have really understood and um, you know, you'll be able to demonstrate uh, competence to conduct an audit. So this is these are the learning outcomes. And uh, as we are going through the webinar, you basically just have to tick through as we go. So that is it all uh, as per the introduction. I'm going to be sharing with you uh, other links and other blogs uh, at the end of this webinar. To summarize this webinar, we are going to give you the, um, <clears throat> we have a blog that we have prepared. And uh, on this blog right here, we are going to summarize everything that I'm going to talk about in this webinar, you know, because you need a point of reference and, uh, you know, just to revisit the content that we have uh, covered. So we have an, um, we have a blog right here, which uh, basically summarizes the seven steps of conducting an audit. And I'm going to share that uh, that blog with you by the end of the webinar. Okay, um, <clears throat> so where is it? So this is the blog that I'm going to share with you, okay? After the webinar, I'm going to share with you the blog of seven steps uh, for performing an ISO management system audit. This is basically going to you know, help you really understand what to do at each stage and so on. So we are going to cover all of these items in detail, and this is only going to be a point of reference for you. Now, with that being said, I think that's all. And um, this is the link for you to uh, to update your CPD points. I'm also going to share uh, how to update your CPD points and exactly what does it mean, okay? Basically, CPD, you know, the idea behind CPD is for you to undergo a training, okay, like this one, 
And me as a tutor in, in a CPD program, I'm expected to demonstrate to you, to show you how to actually conduct an audit. And when you get your certificate like this, you just have to go ahead and conduct an audit for an IMS and you have to upload your auditing activities, the records of your auditing activities, you have to upload them on your digital credential here. That is how you provide evidence that indeed you know how to conduct an audit. So that is going to be, that is the main intended outcome of this training. And I'm going to be giving you as many examples as possible with also relevant information so that you can do that. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, resources and content that you're going to receive, uh, you know, uh, with your $49 package. So I'm going to show you where exactly do you have to use which um, which content to access when you're doing what as we go on, okay? <clears throat> Other than that, I think this is it and uh, we can now get started. So as I said, this webinar, I'm going to give you a practical guidance and experience and knowledge to plan, execute and report on and to follow up on uh, integrated or combined internal audits. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for time out of your busy schedule to attend this webinar. My name is Farai Linton Joy. I'm a risk management consultant at the QHSC Group. Uh, we are based here in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. <clears throat> and I'm going to be your host for today's workshop. So what I'm going to do now, uh, we are going to start off by, of course, really clarifying what is an integrated management system and then how does it work? So, you know, the best way to do this, I'm going to share with you, uh, this is the handbook according to ISO, okay, how you have to implement uh, or how to use integrated management systems. So everything I'm going to say right now is basically on this handbook. So for those who are not going to get um, the package with us, please make sure that you can grab, um, you know, you can grab this um, handbook from the ISO website, okay? Uh, this handbook also, it is this one right here with 120 pages. So this handbook basically consists of case studies and also guidance on how to implement an integrated management system. So I'm going to be quoting and showing you how to implement uh, an integrated management system, et cetera, on like that, how to lead integration, how to plan for integration, and so on. This is very important, as you are going to see uh, when it comes to integrated management system, you really have to make sure that the framework that you use for integration is very, very, uh, is the correct one. So I'm going to start off now with a simple definition. An integrated management system, as you know, uh, this is a framework, okay, or this is a method that um, you you integrate, okay, all the processes they are in framework, enabling your organization to work as a single unit with unified objectives uh, to achieve its purpose and function. So what exactly does this mean when it comes to integrated management system? Well, the integrated management system is applied on business processes like this, okay? So this is an example of, um, <clears throat> of a utility company, just like your electricity and water supply company. So I want to explain the concept of uh, integrated management system and the definition right here. The reason why I'm doing that is because when it comes to IMS audits, the moment you really understand what is being audited, because when you're conducting an audit here, you are you want to determine capability, okay? So you have to gather evidence of conformity, consistency, and continual improvement. So at this point, I'm trying to give you a profound and detailed explanation of how exactly an integrated management system works. That will put you in a position to be able to evaluate performance here. So as you can see, this is basically, these are steps in a process flow. So this is a process flow where you're going to install uh, a solar panel at your house. Okay, it starts off with uh, engaging with consultants. Uh, they give you, uh, you, you submit your application. They approve the design. Uh, the design is now, they go ahead with, you know, technical design and approval. They notify if the design is okay. And then it is connected to your house. And then after that, you are getting your solar panels, et cetera, like that. A very simple process that you are going to use uh, as an example. Now, with that being said, now I want to explain this definition. Now, if we are going to use an integrated management system here, we are going to have one complete framework, okay, so that the organization can work as a single unit with unified objectives to achieve its purpose and mission. What that means is that, you know, this organization here, okay, is going to have unified objectives. That means they are going to have quality, safety, and environmental objectives here. Instead of having three separate management standards, they are going to have 
one separate one uh, integrated management system. They're going to have one management system that is going to manage their safety, quality, and environmental objectives. Further to explain this, let us now go to the Annex SL. So this is a white paper published by ISO uh, when true integration started. So ISO, they said, over the years, we've published many management standards for topics ranging from quality, environment, information security, and business continuity. But back then in 20, 2012, despite sharing common elements, ISO management standard, uh, standards all had different structures. And this in turn resulted in some confusion and difficulties in the implementation stage. And they further on explained that most organizations have more than one management standard to implement and certify. So doing this in individually takes up a lot of uh, time and resources. So there is a clear need to find a way to, of integrating and combining standards in the best. And they said in order to address this problem, I also developed the Annex SL. So this Annex SL now is used by organizations like this. It is used actually to make sure that they have one single framework that is going to uh, manage safety risks, quality risks, and environmental risks and opportunities right here, instead of having three different management standards. So in theory now, it's going to work like this. You are going to have one single framework, which is the Annex SL represented by the IMS. All of these management standards here, they have to meet what you call the goal setting requirements. The idea in using an Annex SL, okay, an Annex SL is going to provide a goal. So all of the management standards that are being integrated, they have to meet this goal, for example, in context, okay? So this statement that I've highlighted in blue should be true for ISO 914 and 45. The same thing also, this is a goal that you're going to be provided for integration. So ISO 914 and 45 all should meet this goal. This is called goal setting requirements. The same thing in clause number six. As you can see right here, this is ISO 914 and 45. What is common in all of these ISO standards is basically this right here, the clauses. So in clause number four, it means that, you know, this blue line right here, it represents this goal that you see in the context of organization. It means that all of these management standards being implemented, they have to meet this goal right here. Same thing goes on in number five. This is the common goal that all the management standards should meet, and that is represented by this leadership right here. And as you can see, in some standards like ISO 9001, there are going to be more sub clauses than the other. It really does not matter. What really matters here is that this goal actually has been met. So this is now the concept of integration. Instead of using, okay, one, two, three management standards, we are not going to be using I914 and 45 to manage this process right here. We are going to be using the Annex SL. Why is it possible to replace three management standards with one structure? Because the Annex SL basically it consists of a common goal in all of these management standards, as you can see right here. So what we are going to do, we are going now to further explain this point on how does it work. So all of these management standards, as you can see here, ISO 914 and 45, all of them, they have to make sure that they meet the common in the Annex SL. Now, to go into the practical element of what exactly, how does that work, I'm going to explain the integrated management system on how it is going to be applied. So the integrated management system consists of inputs, processes, and then outputs. So what exactly are the inputs? The inputs, they are made of risks. These are threats and opportunities to the what? These are threats and opportunities to this process right here. So as you know, what is going to happen in this process, they have to, they have got safety, environmental, and also quality objectives. That means in this process, they have got risk, they have got opportunities and threats for safety, environment, and also uh, quality. So in normally what they would do for safety objectives, for this process to achieve its safety objectives, they would use ISO 45001. For this process to achieve its quality objectives, they would use ISO 9001. For this process to achieve its uh, environmental objectives, they would use ISO 14001. But instead of having three separate management standards, they are going to use one framework, which is the ANSO. And the Annex SO was actually designed in order to integrate the management of these risks and opportunities. So this is now how it is going to work. It's going to start off by determining the inputs, okay? So the inputs, they are made of two sets. They are threats and then the opportunities to the business process flow. So for quality, 
So they can say for quality management, okay, what can affect quality objectives? That is the lack of staff. What can affect safety objectives? That is a poor safety culture. And what can affect uh, environmental objectives? That is lack of awareness. Okay, and then what can actually help them to achieve quality objectives? That is streamlining the process. What can help them to achieve safety objectives? That can be content supervision. And what can also help them to achieve environmental objectives? That is preparing a link. So these are the threats and opportunities that need to be managed in that process that I've shown you. So this is what you call the input into an integrated management system. After these inputs have been determined, what is next? What is next now? They are going to use the Annex SL as the process. The Annex SL is going to address the threats and opportunities within that process so that we are going to neutralize the threats and implement and take advantage of those opportunities. The Annex SL is going to help the organization to plan, do, check, and act. That means plan how we're going to address and manage those, those the inputs, do implement the plan, check to see if indeed those threats and opportunities are being managed, and then add this is now to optimize performance. And that is going to help the organization to achieve its intended outcomes like quality management, zero customer complaints, health and safety, zero injuries, and then environmental uh, management system, 100% legal compliance. So I'm going to explain this now again by showing you this example right here. I think at this point, I also have to tell you that, you know, when you are conducting an audit for an integrated management system, usually where it goes wrong is at the beginning, okay? Once you fail to understand why and how to gather this audit evidence, there is no any chance whatsoever that the audit, the audit, or the audit activities is going to provide any value whatsoever to the organization. So that is why I'm going to explain this process in more detail in order for you to really understand what is being audited and why are we auditing it. So at this point now, I'm still explaining to you how does an integrated management system works. So I'm going now to show you these risks where they come from. So these threats and opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, they exist in these steps. Step number one, step number two, step number three, step number four, number five, number six, and number seven. The first thing you have to do in integrated management system is to look at what can affect, okay, what are the risks at each step here. So in this example, the risks that are involved, okay, the threats and opportunities, the positive and the negative factors that are involved from step number one to seven are these ones, okay? What can affect this step, all these steps, number one to seven, can include lack of staff, poor safety culture, and lack of what, and lack of awareness. What can help this process to achieve its intended outcome it includes streamlining the process. That means reducing the number of steps, having court and supervision, and also preparing a legal register. These threats and opportunities here, they need to be addressed. Why do we need to address these threats and opportunities? So that we can achieve our intended outcomes, okay? So that is going to be the Annex SL. This Annex SL right here, which is this section right here, is going to provide what you call goal setting requirements. So that means this organization is going to follow this framework right here in order to address these threats and opportunities in order to achieve these objectives. So these objectives, zero customer complaints, zero injuries and 100% legal compliance, that is what we need from this process right here. And in order for us to achieve these objectives, we have to manage the threats and opportunities throughout this process. So that is what you have to do, and that is how it works as an integrated management system. To further explain this example, okay, uh, so I'm going to say the integrated management system for the, okay, like this, so that you can see how exactly these things work. So this is now an example of the integrated management system for this organization that we are using as an example. These are the intended outcomes. This is now what they want to achieve using ISO for uh, 4514 and, for, uh, and 9001. These are what you call the intended outcomes. This is what they need to achieve. And in order for them to achieve all of these objectives, they need to address the respective threats and opportunities on this process right here. So that is now why we say the integrated management system, it's going to integrate all of your organizations 
processes into one complete framework, as you can see, so that the organization can work as a single unit. That's why you see it's a process flow with unified objectives to achieve its purpose and mission, as they've stated in the what? In the policy. So this is now what you're going to do. Now we are going to turn into auditing. When you are going to conduct an audit, an IMS audit, what exactly are you going to do? When you are going to conduct an audit for an organization, you need two things. Number one, you need this process flow like this. And number two, you also need to know the intended outcome of the organization. These intended outcomes that have been stated in the policy, this is what the organization wants to achieve after addressing the quality, safety, and environmental issues on this process. That is the integrated management system. So for you as an auditor, you have to determine capability. You have to determine if indeed the organization has got what it takes. Are they doing enough to address the risks and opportunity on this process in order to achieve this, uh, you know, in order to achieve the intended outcome? That is why you say in order for you to do that, you have to gather evidence of conformance, consistent, continual improvement. So that means the auditing equation for integrated management system is going to be like this. And that is what you are going to learn today. So today I'm going to show you how can you conduct an audit for an integrated management system in order for you to determine capability. So we are going to look at this existing business process. Then we are going to gather all the evidence of conformance, consistency, and continual improvement. We compare with the audit criteria in order to determine the findings. At the end, we will be in a position to inform the organization whether or not they are doing enough to achieve these intended outcomes. So this is now going to be a familiar spot for most of you because most of your organizations have an integrated management system policy like this, which is good. The next thing you need are, is basically this process flow and you have to go ahead and gather audit evidence of intent, uh, evidence of conformance, consistency, and continual improvement. So one more time uh, to show you what exactly is up here in order for you to know what is the evidence of intent, conformance, and consistency. So the evidence of consist of uh, consistency, okay, that is basically the ev that means there should be uh there should be a relationship, okay, between these inputs and then these outputs. That means in order for you to have zero customer complaints, the organization should have addressed lack of staff and also streamline the process. For them to have zero injuries here should be because they've addressed poor safety culture and also uh competent supervision. For this objective to be achieved, this is the threat that should be addressed and also the opportunity should be seized like that. That is called the evidence of consistency. And then we are going to ask questions for that. The evidence conformity, okay, uh, that means we need conformance to these goal setting requirements of the Annex SL. In other words, we are going to review documents to determine if indeed this statement is it true in ISO 914 and 45. OK, and then the evidence of continual improvement now, you know, it means that, you know, there should be, uh, let's say these were the threats in January of 23. These were the threats and opportunities available. Now we are in December. We have managed to convert these threats and opportunities into objectives like this. That is called continual improvement. OK, so again, I'd like to really understand what is happening if you come over here. And this is what is happening, okay? This is the organization that you're looking at right here, okay? So this organization, this is the process. This is what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the process for in the organization. And this process, they have got quality threats, they have got safety threats, and they have got environmental management system threats within this process. They also have got opportunities. That means there are opportunities to uh, meet quality objectives, opportunities to meet safety objectives and also opportunities to meet environmental objectives. So what they need to do on their day-to-day -day basis is basically to follow the guidance in the Annex SO in order to achieve these objectives. That is why if you come over here, the Annex SO is going to what? Is going to provide a set of procedures an organization needs to follow in order to meet its objectives. The Annex SO is going to provide a model to follow when they are setting up and operating a management system. So this is how an integrated management system works. And when we are going to conduct an audit, literally what we are doing, we want to see the capability of this process 
we want to see the capability of the organization to manage risks that are re relative to this process in order to achieve these. That is literally what an integrated management system works like, and that is uh, what you have to look out for as an auditor. So this is now an example, and of course, if we do like this, this is now what is happening in the organization. And if we do like this, this is relative to the process. So this is a very important concept for you to understand. That is called the risk-based thinking, and that is how an XSL helps an organization to integrate its standards. The last section now that you're going to look at the Annex SL is how is this going to affect organizations? So management system auditors like you we will now have to use a whole set of generic requirements across all disciplines and industries. That means you are going to use these generic requirements or what you call the goal setting requirements. These are going to become our audit criteria. Okay, so with that being said, let us now go into the steps of conducting an audit. At this point now, we have introduced the, uh, we have looked at the integrated management system with inputs, processes, and the outputs. We have also in, uh, introduced the role of the Annex SL. We have also established the, uh, the you know, the evidence of intent implement. Uh, I keep on saying intent. Sorry, uh, I conducted, um, you know, I was doing um, a webinar for quality management auditing in the in the morning. So, you know, in quality management, you have to gather evidence of intent, implementation, and effectiveness. So that's the, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of confusing it here. In integrated management system, rather, you have to gather evidence of what? of conformance, consistency, and continued improvement as per the equation that I've sent to you. So this is now what you're going to do, and we are going to look at it in seven different steps. So what you do when you're conducting an audit, first of all, is to gather documented information. Documented information is help you understand the context of the organization, and it's also going to help you to um, determine conformance with the, uh, you know, with the audit criteria. That means conformance with the generic requirements of the Annex SL. And then we are also going to create an audit checklist, which is basically a document that reminds you what to do during an audit. And that means in our audit checklist, we are going to list down which questions to ask, which documents to review, and also what to observe. And then we are also going to write an audit plan to inform the auditee on how the audit is going to be conducted and then after that, we also have to gather audit evidence of intent, implementation, and effectiveness. And then now we have to gather evidence of conformance, consistency, and continual improvement. And then we are going to compare it with the audit criteria with the Annex SO requirements. And that is how we are going to determine the audit findings. And then we are going to end up with writing an audit report in all document our findings and also to give feedback to the auditees and we end with the corrective action request and follow up. So this is now what you do when you are going to conduct an audit. And just to repeat to make sure that everyone you understand, before you conduct an audit, you need two things, okay? You need a clearly defined process flow, okay? This is what the organization is doing. And this is also going to be part of our audit scope and also need a uh, intended outcomes, what exactly do they want to achieve or the desired outcomes from that process like that. So once you get hold of these two things now, it is your job as an auditor to gather audit evidence here in order to determine whether or not these intended outcomes can be achieved. All right. So um, for further, also we have included in your course bundle, you are going to get, um, this is a handbook for ISO management system auditors. Uh, so this handbook is very good and uh, it's going to help you in setting up and implementing and managing an audit program in an organization. So everything also that you're going to be on, uh, that you're going to cover in this webinar is also going to be highlighted in this auditor handbook. These audit books uh, and everything is going to come alongside your manual. For those who have not yet received the link for the course bundle, this is the link that you can access the course bundle. And of course, this course bundle, you can get it on the $49 package, which is this one. Please check your email inbox, including all folders, and you're going to see uh, what can you get for $49 and also that package, okay? Uh, as you can see from the post bundle, you're going to see that all of these documents right here, you're going to receive checklists and also procedures on how to do that. So right now, the two main important documents I'd like you to get 
is the ISO handbook. This is the handbook that was published in order to show you examples and that we explain how to integrate the management system properly. And also you have to get the handbook for auditing management systems. Getting these two, you really you are really going to set yourself up for, for success as far as integrate management systems are concerned. So I'm now going to go over now to the first step of conducting an audit. So the first step of conducting an audit here is going to be document review. So when you are looking at document review now, what exactly are you doing? So it's review, um, it's like this. Document review now, that is the same thing as what is happening here. Uh, as you can see, these are footprints on the beach, okay? And these footprints, what they're doing here, they're giving you information. This is documented information in form of footprints. This is evidence that something has happened, okay? And in this case now, we are getting evidence through footprints that someone walked through here and also uh, how many people were there and different type of information really that comes alongside these uh, footprints. So that is the equivalent of documented information. Documented information review is going to let you know which, uh, whether or not this process right here in the organization, did it actually, um, you know, does it meet, okay, uh, all the goal setting requirements within the annex itself? Is there evidence that they've been implemented? And also to help you understand better the organization so that you can know what even threats and opportunities that can affect this process. The same way you understand that this is not a dog, it's a person who walked through here. So in documented information review, this is now to do two things. Number one, for conformance to check whether the policies and procedures and document are there compliant with the IMS and also to get to know the organization better in order to get the audit plan. So in the documented information review, you want to look at and then you want to look for. So what you do here, you open your auditing work paper like this, and then you go to the section of, on, of our documentation review. So what you're going to do here, more specifically as an auditor, you are looking for the following, okay? You want to look for uh, if the documented system, does it respond to the standards? Do the, uh, do the procedures describe what is happening? Is the documentation controlled? Are all employees informed? Uh, are there any procedure, uh, the procedures are big, are they being followed by everyone all the time? And also, is there objective evidence that these procedures are being followed? This is what you need to look for. And then what you need to look at are these documents right here. Okay. So that means under objectives, these are the these are the three documents you have to look for. Under leg down under the requirements, these are the three, these are three documents under aspects and procedures, etc., like that. In this step, documented information review, you have to look for this, okay? And then you have also have to look at these documents right here. And please always remember everything that you are doing here, we are looking at this process flow right here. So that means on this process flow right here, I'm going to come over here and then I'm going to request their legal requirements. I'm going to request their objects and targets. I need the structure and responsibility. I need this training and awareness, et cetera, on like that. This is not only going to show me evidence of con, but it is also going to help me to get the no to get the organ to understand uh, the organization better in order for me to really know what are the relevant threats and opportunities in this organization. So that is the documented information review. And the purpose of documented information review here is basically to prepare yourself for the audit plan and then the audit checklist. So at this point now, what I need you to do is just to know that during the documented information review, I need to look for and I need to look at these documents. And also, uh, as point of reference, this is not to be memorized. There is no any value or any benefit uh, or any breaking rights of uh, memorizing this because all of this information we are going to transfer it into, uh, we are going to use it to prepare an audit checklist. So there's really no need for you to memorize what is uh, what is here, et cetera, on like that. At this point, I just, want you to know, I just want you to know where to get this information. We are going to come back to this document when we are preparing our audit checklist in the next slide, which is now step number two. So step number one of an audit, we need to know evidence of conformance, and we also need to understand the context of the organization. That is going to help us prepare the audit checklist. 
when it comes to creating an audit checklist now what is happening well creating an audit checklist it's like this one right here um so there's going to be a uh, this is something like this okay you know that some people when they go out shopping they've got a grocery checklist okay like you can see some people walking around in a shop with something like this so this is exactly the same thing that you are doing right now and this grocery checklist is very uh it's the same or similar in the way that you prepare an audit checklist in these ways number one in order for you to have a grocery checklist like this you first of all have to review what is in your kitchen what is in your house what is missing that is those are the things that you have to what those are things that you have to uh, put on your list so the same thing when you are preparing an audit checklist first of all you take the results and review from the documented information the checklist that you prepare is customized based on the information that you received from the audit uh, the documented information review that means the checklist i'm going to prepare from this audit is going to be different from your organization because all of you have got different threats and opportunities. You have got different contexts. You have got different objectives. And also, number two, when I'm using a, gro a grocery checklist like this, okay, if I'm going to see bananas before the bread, I have to take bananas, okay? I don't have to go to the end of the shop, the end of the aisle, only to get some bread and come back here. So the main thing here is to make sure that everything on this list has been ticked off. That is the same thing you do when you are conducting an audit. You audit as you go. You don't have to wait until you come back like that. No. Anything you audit as you go until the process is complete. Okay? So that means when I'm going to go to the site or the workplace where this process is going to be applied for, even if I see results of a, you know, audit or anything checklist here, I'm going to gather audit evidence even though we have not yet done a step number one because way the audit checklist is done is basically it covers the whole of this management standard, the, the, the whole of the audit process. Okay? So when you're developing a checklist, this is to remind you what you have to do during the audit. And what do you have to do during the audit? During the audit, you have to gather audit evidence of, um, you have to gather evidence of conformance, continual improvement, and also consistency. Okay? So when you're going to create a checklist, it has to be based on the documented information. That means you should prepare your questions and notes from a checklist, which will help you remember what to do during the audit. It's very important for you to customize this audit checklist, okay? This audit checklist, it looks like this. Uh, so this is now how an audit checklist looks like. And the first step in an, uh, in, a, in an audit checklist is the documented information. So that means if I'm going to prepare an audit checklist for this process here, the first thing I have to request for the documents. So let's say I'm going to request for their objective targets, okay? So that means if I'm going to have, this is the documented information right here, okay? I'm going to say, looking, uh, when we are looking at that process, okay, we are going to have the minutes of objectives, list of objectives, and also related action plans. This is going to determine the questions I'm going to ask, okay? So I'm going to say, uh, I'll come over here and then I'm going to scroll up like this and then I'm going to have these questions. So the question that is relevant here is this one. That means are there any objects and targets associated with each function, okay? So you take it like this and then this is called a lead question. So are there any objects and targets associated with each function, okay? That means each function or each step, I need to see are there any objectives associated with each function here. Step number four, are there any objectives? What do you want to achieve here as far as quality, safety, and environment is concerned? So this is what I'm doing here. And then now what I'm going to do, we now need to gather also evidence of uh, continual improvement, the observations. So I'm going to come over here and then I'll go to the objectives, okay? So in the objectives, this is basically what needs to be observed. Okay, so you take what needs to be observed under objectives, and then I'm going to put it over here like this. So this, as you can see, is basically in the negative form. That means I'm going to ask questions, and then I'm going to review documents to determine which statement is true, and then what is the conclusion we have to reach out here. Okay, so this is now the evidence that I'm going to gather. Remember, it's going to be the evidence of what? Consistence, conformity, and also continual improvement right here. 
And then I'm going to gather audit evidence. What is the audit evidence expected? The audit evidence expected right here, I'm going to use the Annex S. That means I'm going to come over to the management system objectives and the plans to achieve them. And as you can see here, there's what you call a goal setting requirement. That means Annex SO is going to give you a goal that has to be reached at this point. So this is the audit evidence that is expected. It, says, it is expected that particular focus is placed on objectives of the management system. These objects should be measurable, monitored, and communicated, okay? And then after that, I need to look at IMS manual for the organization. So I'm going to say in your IMS manual, what exactly are you expected? How does it look like if this is being implemented? So I'm going to go to IMS objectives. So this is now what I'm going to see. This All of this information that I'm marking up in blue here, this is what I expect to see. This section that I'm marking in blue, that is the interpretation of this goal right here. So you come over um, in this manual and then you scroll down to these associated records. That means when I'm going to request for, uh, when I'm going to be auditing, I'm going to request for these two records. And in those two records, I'm going to look up for evidence of all of this is to, if it was done. And then I come over here and then I'm going to say, these are the associated records like this. So this is now an example of an audit checklist, okay? In this audit checklist, I'm going to use it to conduct an audit on this process flow right here. So that is number one. And then after that, I also come back to this section, okay, for the documented information. And then I'm also going to review the documents for operational control. After operational control, I'm going to come over here. I take the, uh, the respective uh, question, okay? For example, this one for operational control. And then I also look for what? I also go to the operational control for the audit evidence of what? Of uh, the observation. And then I'm also going to come over to this section of the ANSO and I'm going to gather this is the audit evidence that is going to be expected, the uh, audit criteria. So that is now how you prepare an audit checklist. And this is now an example. As I said, all of these examples and completed checklists, you are going to get them in this auditor handbook right here. So that is now how you prepare an audit checklist. This is just a document that reminds you what to do during an audit. And as you can see, during the audit, you have to ask questions, you have to review documents, and this is what you have to observe from this audit evidence. I'm going to compare to this audit evidence and I'm going to determine the findings. And I'm going to do the same right here and so on and so on. So if I put more time, I'm also going to show you how to do it on another example. So this is how you create an audit checklist. After the audit checklist has been created now, we now have to communicate with the auditee to tell them um, how the audit is going to be conducted. At this point in your audit plan, okay, you are going to describe to the to the auditees what were the results of documented information review. That means you are going to explain what exactly the audit is going to be looking at. And then also your audit checklist is going to be attached to the audit plan. It's going to all form part of a description on how the audit is going to be conducted. An audit plan is like an explainer document. You're explaining to the auditees what is the purpose of the audit? Why are you conducting the audit? And this audit, as you know, it's an IMS audit. IMS audits, they are conducted to determine capability. You want to determine whether or not the organization does it have a framework in place to address those threats and opportunities in order for them to achieve their intended, which they have stated in the policy statement of intent. So the audit uh, plan is going to include the audit purpose, the audit scope, what is the audit scope here? The audit scope is the boundary of the audit, okay? So this is the boundary of the audit here. These seven steps, this is where we are going to be conducting our audit. And then also the audit criteria, these are now the goal setting requirements or the generic requirements that all auditors will now use, who we have to use from the Annex itself. And also what is the objective of the audit? This is now for evaluating performance to determine capability. So the audit plan, it looks like this. Um, so this is a template for an audit plan. An audit plan is part of explaining how the audit is going to be conducted. You have to cover three areas, general information about the audit, 
how the, the audit process and also the evaluation strategy, okay? So all the general information, you are just telling them uh, the purpose of the audit. So this audit will be conducted to determine the ability of the organization to achieve its intended outcomes or its IMS objectives. So let me again just explain to you what is happening here. What is happening? We are going to conduct an audit, okay? Looking at this organizational process, this is a process flow in an organization. Your organization, your company also, they have got something like this, you know, give or take five, seven, ten steps like that. And what you are going to do here, we need to determine whether or not, okay, are we capable to achieve these intended outcomes? All of these intended outcomes, what you have said on your IMS policy right now here, this is what you want to achieve when we are going through this process right here. And in order for you to achieve that, you have to address quality, safety, and environmental issues, okay? So in, in order to do that, you have turned up to the Annex SL. The Annex SL is going to produce a set of procedures to follow so that you can meet those objectives. So that is why we are conducting an audit we want to determine if you are capable. And then the audit scope, this is very important. This is the scope that you are going to do. So in this case now, the audit scope is going to be the solar panel connection process, okay? And then um, the systems overview, you also have to highlight what the audit is going to cover. So the audit is to cover the inputs into that process, which are basically the kind of opportunities. It's going to cover the process, how you plan, how you implement, how you check to see the process working and act and also the output, input, output, and then the processes, okay? And then the second part now, you have to explain the audit process, how the audit is going to be conducted. So this is now we are going to do compliance and performance evaluation. Uh, these are the roles the audit is going to do this. The auditors, these, they never change, okay? These roles and responsibilities for auditees, the organization audit team, they never change, but it's very important for you to give a heads up to the auditees to avoid any confusion. And then also you have to write the method of the audit, how the audit is going to be conducted, the sequence of the audit, okay? And then that is of course, as per the ISO 19011 guidelines 2018. And then the audit now is going to have four stages. I'm going to start off with the opening meeting, whereby you are going to explain the audit process, and also we explain the audit checklist, what kind of audit evidence are you going to gather? And then also the examination and evaluation, that means which questions you are going to ask, which documents you are going to review, and then what exactly are you going to observe? And then we are also going to write reports in two, in two forms. There's going to be one report for the completed audit checklist and another audit report for the uh, in form of an audit report. Uh, and then also we are going to have the closing meeting. That means we are going to explain the audit findings and to explain what happens next. And so we have to tell them the visiting plan. When are you going to come for the audit? What time? Who is going to be audited or interviewed at which time like that? So this is what you're going to do from step number four to number seven. We are going to be following through everything that we have highlighted or determined or explained or stated in the um policy statement of intent. And then also you have to explain this section right here, audit findings, how exactly are they going to be classified? Okay. And then that means in the evaluation, you start off by explaining to the auditees, how are you going to determine audit findings if you are recording a conformity or a non-conformity? All of these items, we are going to look at them, of course, when we are uh, from step number four, five, six, and seven like that. At this point, I'm just showing you and pointing you out to um, where exactly this information is found. Remember, is as I said at the beginning of the webinar, the idea of the CPD program, okay, is for you to record and update your CPD. That is the main purpose why you have to take a course like this. What that means is like, you know, you have to go ahead and conduct your own audit, okay, and then you attach your audit activities to this certificate. That means you have, you should attach your audit plan, your audit uh, checklist, and so on. This is going to provide evidence that indeed you know how to conduct an audit. Okay. So that is basically how you maintain and you update your CPD. And as you can see in this webinar, that is why I am doing it in form of an explainer way. What I have to do in this webinar, besides explaining, is to point you to the relevant information. 
you know, because honestly speaking, auditing is not something that is very complicated. It's more of having access to the right information. Once you just know where to get the information from and how to do it, then everything is easy, okay? So that is what I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to explain to you where to access that information and what to do with that information. The thing in auditing, there's no any requirement to memorize anything. You don't have to memorize the audit plan. You don't have to memorize the audit checklist. You don't have to memorize anything. Each of these items, they are prepared at the beginning of each or of each um, of each of each uh, audit. That's why you see the cost bundle that you are going to get. It consists of a lot of information. It has got guidance on integrated management system, a record, this webinar forms and checklist, and so on, so that you can have all the information that you need when you are preparing for an audit. Okay. So that being said, now uh, as part of explaining, you also have to uh, give them examples of a uh, you know, of a non-conformity and you give them examples of a major non-conformity, you explain what is a minor non-conformity and an observation, which is uh, which are the items that you are also going to look at when we are going to be writing our audit reports and recording our audit findings. So this is an example of an audit um, of an audit plan that you have to send to the auditees. And if they agree with everything, that means they have to sign here and also to put the date that will give me confirmation that indeed the audit is ready and we can proceed right here. So that is what you do when you're writing the audit. It's basically to make sure that everyone who is involved in this process flow right here, they really understand how the audit is going to be conducted and what the auditor is going to be looking for. Okay, after that now, we are now going to go to the step of gathering the audit evidence of actually conducting the audit. So this step now, remember, we said when you are going to conduct an audit, this is what you do. You look at the test flow and then you are going to gather audit evidence of conformance, consistency, and control improvement. You compare it, um, you know, you you put it over, okay, you, you, you this is the auditing equation that you're going to use. You gather audit evidence, you compare it to the audit criteria, and then you compare it to the, um, you know, and then that is how you're going to determine the audit findings. And this auditing equation is applied to a process flow like this. And that is what you are going to do in step number four. So at this point from step number four to step number seven, we are following through the audit plan. There's nothing that has to change here. So at this point now, the audit is fundamentally a comparison of audit evidence, the audit criteria to determine the audit findings. We are now going to go to the workplace, okay? I am going to talk to people for interviews, look for records, observe, and also to determine if the organization is compliant with their own documentation and with other requirements. So during the audit now, this is conducted in four stages, okay? The audit is going to start off with an opening meeting. It's very important for you to explain the audit process. That means you're going to go to the second section of your audit plan and explain how the audit is going to be conducted, how your audit checklist is going to be conducted. At this point, you have to explain the auditing equation. Make sure that the auditees, they understand which questions are going to be asked and why are you going to ask those questions. What exactly is evidence of conformance? And what is evidence of consistence? And what is the evidence of continual improvement? Also, you have to make sure that you share the audit checklist with the auditees. The second step now, you are going to use your audit checklist and then you have to gather audit evidence throughout the process flow. That means you are going to do fake finding, interrogating the system, and you have to analyze your findings. That means at this point now, after you've gathered your audit evidence, after you've asked the questions, you you um you have, and then you also uh you know, and then you also review documents. You are going to compare to the annex SL goal setting requirements in order for you to determine the findings. And then your reports now they come in two times. Yeah, the first form of reporting is going to be a completed audit checklist. And the second form of reporting is going to be the official audit report. And then the last step now is going to be the closed meeting where you have to advise the audit and also to advise them on what happens next. So right now, I'm now going to give you a more uh, example of how exactly an audit is conducted. So look, this is now where we are at this point now, we have our clear process flow, and then we have our audit checklist. So this is now what you're going to do 
and we are going to gather evidence, okay, on this audit question and then also on this documented information. So, of course, we start off with the documented information. Remember, when you are reviewing these documents, you have to come over here and then I'm now looking for. So I have to check, does this respond to the standard? Does it describe what is happening? Is it controlled, informed, uh, or is everyone informed and is it being followed by everyone all the time? So if let's say these minutes of objectives, if they are, if let's say they are not documented, I'm just going to highlight red. If the list of objects and targets, if they are okay, I'm just going to write green. If the related action plans, maybe their everything is okay, but they, they have not yet, they are not followed by everyone all the time. I'm going to put it what? Like within the non-conformity. This is just a color coding that you can use as an auditor. And then I'm also going to check if there are any targets and objectives associated with each function. That means I'm going to look at this process flow right here. And then I'm going to look, do you have uh, smart objectives on step number one, number two, number three, number four, and also including the overall intended outcomes like this on the, that process flow, okay? So if that is the case here, I'm just going to mark this right here like green. So after that, now we now have to gather this audit evidence. That means these questions and then these documents. Through an auditor meeting, based on this information, I now have to look like, okay, with the information I have, the objects and targets, do they reflect policy requirements? So let's say no. If they do not reflect policy requirements, again, you just do color coding. If they demonstrate continual improvement, I'm just going to what? I'm just going to mark this as a green. If they're not linked to significant risks, et cetera, like that, I'm just going to mark them red like that. And then this is what you're just doing at this point. You observe based on the audit evidence that you have gathered. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to take this completed audit evidence. That means the information from my observation, the questions in the document, and I'm going to compare with this audit evidence expected. That means I need to determine the information on this side. Is it the same with the information on what is expected? Okay, so if let's say I disagree, I'm going to mark disagree right here, and then I'm going to come over here, and then I'm going to go to this chart here. And then that means this is the audit finding that I'm going to record. And then I'm going to come over here. Okay, and then I'm going to put my description like this, you see? And then let's say if I strongly disagree, for example, let's say I say I strongly disagree, I just have to, okay? I, of course, I'll just have to remove this like that. And then I'll just come over here. And this is going to be my strongly disagree audit finding like this, all right? My audit finding is going to be recorded like this. So this is now what you do when conducting an audit, okay? Let me just give you another quick example before we go anywhere, okay? So let's say, again, I'm going to conduct an audit right here in this process step, right? And then I'm going to, okay, I want to give you another example here. I think I've got some extra time. So I'm going to show you how you prepare an audit checklist. So first of all, I'm going to look for operational control, okay? So I'm going to say, these are the, this is the documented information I'm going to need for operational control like that. So I'm going to say documented information here, and then I'm going to paste it like this, okay? Like that. So these audit checklists, again, they are already, uh, you know, they are already in your audit, in your auditor handbook right here. I'm just giving you another example, you know, to explain these points on how exactly what is happening here. And then that means if the documented information is here, that is also going to select the question. So I'm going to say here, how do you know what to do the operating uh, criteria? That means I'm going to be asking this question to the people who are responsible uh, with these, uh, you know, people who are involved in these different stages of the process flow. So I'm going to say my lead question here is, how do you know what to do? I'm going to ask for procedures and operating criteria. What is the audit evidence expected here? This is operation control. So you go to the Annex SL, and then this is the goal that has to be met, okay? So I need to see the organization. Uh, the organization should address, okay, both in-house and outside process and also to manage change. So this is now going to be the 
audit criteria expected right here. Okay, so this is now what is going to happen. And then what about the observations? I'm going to come over here and this is going to be the observations I'm going to do. So you see how easy it is now to create uh, an audit checklist. So this is now going to be the, uh, this is now going to be the items that I'm going to observe. So again, when I'm going to be conducting an audit here, okay, I just have to look at this, uh, at this process flow in the organization, and then I should now start gathering my audit evidence. The questions I'm going to ask here and also this documented information should give me results on whether or not has this been done, okay, or if this actually has been done correctly like that. And then you're going to record usually in form of a group meeting or as auditors like this. And then here, let's say my audit finding here, this is going to be an observation. I'm just going to come over here and then I'm going to put my X's here. And that means my audit finding, I've just come over here and I'm going to put description like this, all right? So that is basically what it is going to look like. Of course, this is a loosely tied example, but hopefully you can get the idea of how these things look like. And then, of course, after that, we will go to the next set of documented information and then we review and then we review, okay? That is how we conduct an audit. And to explain to you what exactly is happening, the idea here is that this organization right here, okay, they need this process to deliver quality objectives, safety objectives, and environmental objectives, but they don't want to duplicate these processes. They don't want to use three separate management standards. They want to use one. So if you want to use one framework instead of three, you have to use the Annex SL. The Annex SL is going to provide a framework and procedures to follow in order to meet quality, safety, and environmental objectives. When you are going to conduct an audit, that is exactly what you want. That is what you want to verify. You are going to look at that question, question and then you have to gather evidence of conformance, consistency, and continual improvement. And you do it using this audit checklist like this one right here. And then after you write these findings now, we now have to proceed to write the internal audit report. Okay, so here now in the audit report now, this is now, uh, again, it, the audit report is written in uh, as per the ISO 19011 guidelines. So this is the general part where you have to fill out the audit scope, the audit criteria, and then the audit objectives. And then also you have to look at the, you have to write the audit findings, determine what, what were the conformities and which were the non-conformities. And also you have to write the audit conclusions on how much the organ chain is compliant with the IMS and how well the management system fulfills its uh, objectives. So when you are going to write your IMS audit report, you have to write an audit report using this template. Again, you are be reporting on this process flow like that, okay? And then what you're going to do, you start off with this scope. So in this case, let's say we did the scope was for seven locations, for du you know, Dubai operation seven locations, that means we audited seven locations, basically that were uh, that are using this process, for example, okay? And then what was the audit criteria? Of course, the audit criteria, this is the audit evidence expected. What did you expect in order to determine conformity to agree? These were the annex requirements, the goal setting requirements. What was the objective of this audit to determine the organization's capability to achieve its intended outcome? Which is the reason why you conduct uh, IMS audits? Audits uh, for IMS, they are conducted to determine capability. There is no certification audits for IMS, okay? An organization cannot be certified to IMS because um, the IMS is based on, uh, on, on goal setting requirements, which is the Annex SL. So you cannot certify goal setting requirements. For a certification audit, you need prescriptive requirements, which are like uh, ISO 914 and 45. So, you know, for all audits for uh, IMS, it's basically capability or evaluating. Uh, if you want to put it in the sense of performance evaluation, you are just evaluating the capability, which comes off to the capability. You know, the, uh, the simple idea or simple reason for audits in IMS is just to look at the IMS policy statement of intent. This is what you want to achieve. And I'm going to look at your processes to determine whether or not you are capable to achieve it. And I'm going to use an audit checklist like this 
to inform you if or not you can achieve those intended outcomes. It is as simple as that. So that is now what you're going to do here. When you're going to summarize the results of an audit, okay, the best way you come over here and then um, you look for reasons why actually people conduct uh, audits. And, and then you can just come over here and then you can just copy these reasons why people conduct audits, okay? So these are some of the reasons why people conduct audits. And definitely these are some of the reasons why an organization like this would like to conduct an audit. So audits now, you can use that to summarize the results of an audit. IMS audits, they provide means of confirming the IMS policy is understood and is being implemented. And then you have to write now, what was it now, uh, your findings based on the audit that you conducted? Was the IMS policy understood and being implemented? So you can just come over here and then you say, the IMS policy is, is not understood and is, okay? Just like that, you'll see. And then also you come over here, they give management content that the management system is being implemented in the manner prescribed. And then you can just say here, the, um, okay? So you can come over here and then say, the, okay, the IMS, all right, is being implemented in the manner prescribed, if that is what you saw on this audit, uh, you know, audit finding. Again, they provide structured means of identifying deficiencies in the system. So you can say, okay, um, deficiencies in the system, something like that, deficiencies in the system, okay, were identified under, okay, like this. So we can say, what are the steps here? Um, okay, the steps, they have them here. Okay, so you can say under step number four, okay, like that, you see? That is how you write, uh, this is just an example. And then let us just say two steps and step number seven, no, let's say number six. Okay, this is where you found efficiencies from, okay? Like that, you see? And then also uh, the enable system weakness to be highlighted before uh, any related potential problems like that. And then you can say, okay, so let us be positive here. So you can say, uh, so here you can say there is no evidence, okay, of system, okay, system or let's say the proof weakness, okay, Uh, to be related before the potential problems are reflected. Okay, like this, okay? So that is what you do. So as you can see, what I'm doing right now, I'm just summarizing the audit. So the best way for you to summarize the audit, you know, you just look at the reasons why people conduct audits, you know, and then you can just use that one to summarize the, um, to summarize the audit report. Not only these, uh, you know, not only these uh, reasons, but any other reasons that like need that you can find that people need, you can just use them like that. After that, now we're going to report now on the Annex SO from the clouds number four, five, and six. So this is now the Annex SO. Um, so this is now the Annex SO. So what I'm going to do now, now going to be reporting on the uh, on these clouds, clouds number four, number five, number six. Remember, the goal here is for all of these managements, uh, you know, this goal right here, which is marked in blue, should be true for ISO 9, 14, and 45. This should be true for ISO 9, 14, and 45. This should be true for ISO 9, 14, and 45, okay? So first now, we conducted an audit for clause number six and also clause number, um, we conducted number six and number eight, okay? So let me just copy this right here. And then I'm going to do like that, okay? So it's number six, and then there is clause eight, which is operation, okay? These are the, this is where the two examples uh, I gave you came from. Okay, so clause number, you know, this is based of course on this audit checklist. So this one right here, this was for clause number six. So when you're going to write your audit report, you just have to come over here and then First of all, you have to write or, you know, 
what was your line of inquiry. So you come over here and then you say, my line of inquiry for number six was for, uh, you know, of course, are there any objectives associated with each function? Okay. And then also for operations, what was your line of inquiry? So I'm just going to do this simultaneously in order for you to really see that, you know, it's literally the same thing. What you're going to do in six, seven, you are going to do it all in all of these management standards. Okay. So here now I'm also going to write, this was my line of inquiry like that. Okay. So what about the audit evidence? Here now the audit evidence is in form of documented information. Okay. And also in form of procedures. You see? So that is also the same thing here. The documented information is the same so as what you're going to see right here. Okay? Like that. And then what about the documented information? I'm going to come over to my checklist and I'm going to take my documented information like this. All right? So on my documented information, I'm going to put it on this. So they are going to ask me, uh, or I have to report now, on the minutes of objectives. So the minutes of objectives here, it was read. Why was it read? Uh, there, are, there are different reasons, maybe because of these, uh, let's say these three reasons right here. Okay, this is what I did not like about what? About these minutes of objectives. So you can say minutes of objectives, and then you just have to write down what did you find. And then you can say here, just say some employees are not informed Okay, some employees, then you say they're not informed. And then, uh, you know, and then you can say here procedures, the procedures are not followed. Okay. Everyone all the time, that means the objective procedures. And then also there is no, okay. So there's no objective evidence that the procedures are being followed, okay? So that is the reason why this was a read uh, in my audit findings. You see what is happening. And then you go to the next documented information, list of objects and targets. And uh, here, everything was okay. So you can just going to say everything here is satisfactory, okay? There's no need for anything here. Just say this is satisfactory and you can just give it a color code green like this, all right? And then for these related action plans, one thing was missing because, you know, everything else maybe was okay, but you just saw that, you know, maybe this documentation was not controlled. Other than that, everything else is okay. So you just say that is the, uh, you know, so you can say documentation not controlled here, okay? This is just an example, you see? So this is now how you're going to write. And then that's going to be the same thing on documented information also here, uh, you have to come over and then you say, this is what I saw. And then you just have to write on your audit finding, uh, on your audit report, okay, which is read and the reasons behind it like that. And then you come over to the procedures. So these procedures, it's going to be this section right here, okay? So this is now the section. So you just copy, uh, let me just take these ones for reference. Okay, and then we are going to bring them over here. So the first one, if this was uh, in our audit plan, if this was objects and target, if this was a red, we are going to leave it like that, okay? That means, you know, the, the statement, nothing changes. But if this was, um, if now, if this was a red, object is the demonstrate continual improvement, so we have to change. Objects and targets, we are going to say, okay, demonstrate continual improvement like that. And then we look at the other one, and then we say they are not linked, this is true, so we are just going to leave it like that, okay? But let's say this one, this was a green, we're just going to say they are documented and distributed to relevant actions. So that is also going to be the same thing that you do here. At this point, I just hope you, you understand that this is not going to be uh, like a repetition. Once you see one example, it's really going to be, you know, the same uh, the same cycle is going to be the same like that. And also you are going to get some, um, you receive also some case studies from this handbook uh, for ISO management system auditors, okay? This handbook, uh, once you get it, you just have to open um, like that. 
So someone is asked, uh, is it necessary to have a, a single specific IMS policy? Um, yes, the IMS policy actually in this in this context it's it's actually mandatory. You you should you know because that is the IMS policy that you have. So yes, it's actually mandatory for you to have a single IMS policy. Other than you know, if you are going to have one policy for ISO 914 and 45, then you know it's really not integrated, is it? Okay, the whole idea of an IMS is is basically to reduce the policies, procedures, and systems from three to one. Okay, so actually before an audit, okay, this is actually required. The organization at this point should actually have stated what they want to achieve. Okay, these are the intended outcomes. So yes, this is actually mandatory like that. This is actually a pre-requirement to auditing. As I said, when you're conducting an audit for an IMS, you need a policy like this, and you need the, um, the process flow like this. Without these two things, there is no way that you can conduct an audit, okay? Because this is what is being audited. Literally what you're doing when you're conducting an audit, you are looking at the process flow right here, and then you are basically uh, looking for evidence to determine capability. Are you capable of achieving these objectives? And in order for you to achieve these integrated objectives here, you should actually be also managing and analyzing the risks here, okay? The relevant risk for safety environment and whatever, uh, safety environment and quality that are relevant to this organization like that. So of course, on the audit findings, this is now when you are just going to come over here from your audit checklist and then you have to take this statement like this, and this is going to be your audit finding that you're going to put it over. So instead now, but here now uh, you have to make sure that what exactly was this expectation? So there's no evidence that the uh, objectives, okay, uh, the objectives or targets, okay, um, the program, is recognized to be an IMS requirement. There's no implementation plan. And then the audit just goes over here. You can just say that was right. So this is now what you go also to number eight. You do the same for number seven. You do the same for number six, number five, and like that. So this is now how you write an audit report like that. And as you can see, uh, the way if you present an audit report like this, this is a direct feedback to, to a process like this. They are really going to know that, okay, what was wrong, what did they do right, and what was really missing here, okay? So that means the next point of uh, what they're going to do next, they're going to look at the minutes of objectives at each function, they're going to make sure that these are closed out, and then also they need to understand what they're doing wrong and what they're doing well. That is basically how you write your audit, um, your audit findings in an IMS audit. So after the audit report now, you now have to go ahead and write the corrective actions. So when you're writing out the corrective action request now, at this point you are requesting an organization to resolve any nonconformity. That means, you know, it means that uh, there, there are some red flags that have been identified and you have to initiate the process of resolving those nonconformities that have been found. So the way you do it now, you just have to use a document like this, okay? So you start off by clause, so you can say clause six, Okay, which is the what you did, and then the category we said that is a minor non-conformity or minor non-conformance, the area or process. Okay, let's say um which process I think okay. So this is the area and process, site inspection and connection, like this. Okay, that is what you do here. Okay, and then the statement of non-conformance. This here's to be and always should be a red flag, okay? So let's say this is the red flag here. So he said uh, the red flag at the site connection and like that, there is no detailed means of achieving objects and targets given. That means, you know, because this process right here for the site inspection, it has got some objectives that they want to meet, right? Even at this step right here, there are quality, safety, and environmental objectives they want to meet right here during the connection stage and the, and the site inspection. Okay, and some of those objectives they've been listed right here. Okay, they want to make sure that there's fully, uh, you know, let's say for example here they want to uh, make sure ensure stakeholders happiness. Okay, but now how are you going to ensure stakeholder happiness at this stage right here? So maybe during the audit that is what you found, and then you said 
there's no really detailed means of achieving that objective in step number six. Okay, so what exactly are the clause requirements here? What was supposed, you know, what, what should have happened? So what should have happened here, you have to come back first of all to the Annex SL, and then you can, uh, you have to show them the goal setting requirements, okay? So this is basically going to be the same as this section, right? So you're going to tell them particular focus should be placed on objectives exactly as what has been uh, stated in the Annex SL, all right? And then after that, you now have to go to the IMS manual. So in this IMS manual now, you have to look for um, how exactly were they supposed to give detailed means of achieving the objectives? What were they supposed to do? So this is something that uh, they've said here. To achieve better objectives and targets, uh, the management program established that goes into concrete action. So that means for each um, to achieve each objective, there should be stepwise action, resource requirement, for each step or target and cetera on like that. And this has to be reviewed by the uh, top management, et cetera on. Okay. This is just what uh, the, this is what uh, you expected to see. And of course, this has not been the case, but you should make sure that, you know, you let them know. Okay. Because you as an auditor, yours is actually to explain the meaning of these or findings. For example, so what you're doing here is like, I was looking, okay, we conducted an audit. In step number six, there's no detailed means of achieving quality, safety, and environmental outcomes here. Okay, this was the requirement. This is what you're supposed to do, and this is how you were supposed to do it. Okay, and then now we come to the objective evidence. Why do you say there's no detailed means of achieving objectives here? And then you said, well, when I looked at step number six here, okay, um, I you know I saw the okay. Let me give you the example. So you say in step number six, I was looking at the um, at the action plans, related action plans are for objectives and targets here. Okay, so you can say uh, when I look for the action plan, objective evidence should be from documented information, and then you can just say when I looked at these uh, at these related action plans, I saw that you know these three things have not been done. They were not. Some employees are not informed. The procedures are not being followed and there's no objective evidence that these procedures are being followed which is more or less like the same thing that we did here so let me just uh, copy from this point and then you have to put your reasons out like this is the reason okay why i say there is no detailed means of achieving your objectives like that okay so always remember the clearer your audit findings and the audit work papers are the better it is for the auditees so at this point now, I'm going to take this non-conformance report and I'm going to send it back to this uh, to the organization here like that, okay? That is basically how you initiate the process of uh, the corrective action, which is going to bring us to step number seven. At this point now, I'm now going to make sure that indeed that non-conformity in step number six has been really resolved. So I'm going to do another follow-up of uh, Follow up, which is going to be uh, a kind of a small audit focused only on non conformities, and I'm going to use my internal audit techniques. So, in step number seven, now what is going to happen is like this I'm going to come back and then I'm going to pick up from here. So, the organization here should have done uh, a root cause analysis so they can do the five wise method, okay, for whatever that they've done uh, for any root cause analysis that is suitable for them in order for, you know, so that they can establish what, why exactly they did not have any digital means of achieving these objectives, okay? So these reasons, it can be like, let's say uh, in step number six, they were not aware or they, they were not competent. So they have to put what you call a pilot solution, okay? So this pilot solution, this is basically a proposed idea. How exactly are they going to make sure that, you know, step number six here, is not going to have the same problem again. So they, make, they can say, say we have agreed with the, uh, we have appointed a new supervisor in this step, he's been trained, he's aware of uh, IMS procedures, and we have also set these objectives. They are now available with stepwise action on step number six. So that is called a pilot solution. And then now this step number seven, you, the auditor, now you are going to conduct an audit to determine if this pilot solution proposed uh, solution or in, in order to address this this root cause no, not to happen again in step number six it is okay then 
we are going to pass it and that is going to become the permanent solution and that is going to be the corrective action which is going to be approved and also updated within the organization ins what ins manual or anything that they have so that is when now the audit is going to close out like that okay so as we said now that is now uh, on step number seven and that now basically is how you conduct an audit for an IMS. So to close up this webinar now, I'm going to, um, this is what you need to do when you're conducting an audit. Again, let me share with you these intended outcomes on how exactly to conduct an audit. What you do when you get your uh, IMS policy and your IMS process flow, this is now what you have to do. Make sure, you know, you uh, write an audit plan you prepare an audit checklist, and then also you use the audit checklist to gather audit evidence. You should write the audit findings from your checklist, and then also understand how the how to audit the process and performance of an IML. Hopefully, the example I gave you from uh, this utility company is going to show you how exactly to conduct the audit. And also, I've given you an example of an what of an audit report, and also how to prepare the follow up on this audit finding. So. These were all just the examples on what you can get uh, alongside your course bundling toolkit. So in order to conclude uh, and uh, wrap up this webinar, be careful not to skip any of the seven steps in an audit, internal audit process, because you know uh, this is a process-based audit. And what you're doing now, we are, you know, you should actually make sure you know that, that is linked to ISO 19011, which are the guidelines for the IMS audit. And you should also thoroughly perform the documented information review in order to prepare yourself for the audit, right? Uh, documented information, always remember, this is the cornerstone of an audit. This is the first step of an audit. And it's very important because during documented information review, you are not only going to uh, see the every get to know the organization better, but that is also going to give you evidence of conformance and also help you to prepare the audit checklist. Also, create your own audit checklist. There's no such thing as a ready-to-go checklist. All the checklists, they are different from each organization. So what you're going to ask is going to be different. On the audit checklist itself, you've seen that, you know, they've asked you, uh, well, how do you know what to do? Okay, that was one of the questions. And you know that, you know, there are operational procedures, they are different from a utility company, from a laundry company, construction company, a nuclear facility. This has to be different. So should be also the audit evidence that you're going to gather. So the audit checklist, they're prepared based on the review of documented information. Your internal audit report should be short and precise, straight to the point, do not wander around as per the template that I have shown you. And then also you should initiate the corrective action if you have identified any red flags and you should consider your job done only after the pilot solution has been verified as an effective means to resolve these non-conformities and corrective actions like that. So that is how you conduct an audit for an IMS, okay?